it's the Van Dyne Masters mini review of Doctor Who Season 11, Episode 3, Rosa. Sometimes I like to put things into context, but what the hell context is there to put in here? It's 2018. This thing takes place in 2018. We all know what things are like now, so hey, none of that. In terms of a non-spoiler review, I think, frankly, that this is a great episode. It is, to me, very interesting that this episode happens to coincide with my review of Predestination. Because Predestination and this have some things in common. Now, the story was, in many ways, kind of predictable to me. However, I have to tell you that it's so well made that by the end it sort of brought a tear to me. I... Uh, even after multiple, multiple viewings, which is a good thing, it's an indica indication it's a well-made episode, uh, and doing that to me is damned near impossible, because as the Fandai Master, I have seen it all. I am very rarely emotionally moved by anything that I watch. So that's a good thing. That's a really good sign. It was well shot. Performances are great all along, and I honestly believe that this is a great episode. So, having gone out of non-spoiler territory, I have to issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert. And that is because I am the Fandai Master. And that means that the fandom is a strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour early. This is neither a boast nor a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself. After having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years worth of science fiction, you just can't see the new stuff for the entire century that went before, and you find out there isn't much that's very new in all the world. So, my spoiler review of this puppy. Going through the synopsis as briefly as I possibly can... The Doctor and her crew end up uh, in 1955 Montgomery, Alabama, instead of Sheffield, where they have apparently been trying to get to repeatedly, which I find amusing. Uh, one second while I do something here. Okay. Um, but before attempting to leave, the Doctor finds out that there are traces of Artron energy in the area from another time-traveling device. So they decide to investigate, and the group um, learns that they have arrived the day before Rosa Parks refused her bus seat for James F. Blake on December 1st, which effectively did influence the civil rights movement in real life. So in seeking out this source of energy, the doctor discovers it has come from a vortex manipulator owned by a recently paroled uh, criminal from the future called Crasco. The group realized that Crasco is trying to change history to ensure Parks never had, the, had to refuse the, the uh, seat to Blake. So after using his equipment to uh, attempt to uh, shield herself from being displaced into the future, the doctor learns that Kraskow was imprisoned for murder, and when he was let out, there was a strict a restrictor placed in his brain preventing him from killing anyone, including Rosa. Otherwise, obviously, he could just do that. So unable to convince him to abandon his changing history, she and her friends uh, focus on thwarting his scheme by ensuring uh, Parks realize, uh, refused to seat her seat to Blake at the appointed time and under the exact circumstances of the incident. Although Crasco works to uh, counter their efforts, the group stays one step ahead of him, making certain that everything goes on track. When Ryan does his best to stop notices at bus stops because Crasco is going around, they, they've tried to cancel the bus, Crasco's going around, putting up signs and say the bus doesn't work, but he encounters Crasco, Ryan does, b uh, blocking the bus route with his car, and Ryan learns that the criminal actions are motivated by his deeply racist views. And Ryan used the temporal gun from Crasco's equipment to, s equipment to send him in the past. That gun is pretty nasty, man. Just sends you into the past. That's rather astonishing. <laughs> Uh, in any case, as the moment, uh, uh, Ryan and the others then uh, join the doctor on the bus, and as the moment arrives, the doctor forces her companions to remain on the bus because they realize that they have now become integral to this event, 
In other words, they're in a predestination paradox where the doctor and her companion is not there, there wouldn't have been uh, there wouldn't would have been room for passengers, and Rosa wouldn't have had to give up her seat. So, after witnessing Rosa Parks being arrested by the police for violating the segregation laws, the group returns to the TARDIS with the knowledge that they have played a role in Parks becoming an icon for freedom, and scene. That's the general plot. There's a little more detail involved in that, but uh, you know that's the general plot. And if you've followed me past uh, the spoiler, that means hopefully you, you have already watched the episode. Otherwise, I've just killed it for you. So, as usual, I try to get my cringe moments out of the way first. My first cringe moment is, why are there still racists? And I think they said the 74th century. I mean, this is something that, despite what modern leftists would have you believe, is less of an issue than you think. Now, are there some racists out there? Yeah, absolutely there are racists out there. But they are constantly diminishing in numbers. While the left does like to call anybody who's right of Che Guevara some kind of Nazi or fascist or racist, the reality is that I have been watching racism die over the course of my entire life. When I was a child, there was a kid that I was pretty good friends with. I won't mention his name, but I was pretty good friends with, a black kid. It was normal at that time to refer to black people with the N-word. We called it to him to his face. We actually called it to him to his face. And, uh, well, I'm sure it hurt his feelings, but it was pretty damn common. And now, well, the 1970s, we pretty much got that out of our lexicon. Now, I don't, honestly, I don't remember the last time that I heard a black person referred to by the N-word. I'm sure it must happen. And it may happen in other places in the country other than beautiful downtown, or midtown, rather, Lincoln, Nebraska. But none of my friends have ever done it. Not, I really don't remember it. I don't remember it ever happening. And, you know, you do get some agitation groups like Black Lives Matter. And the problem with them is when you look very carefully at their poster children, you find that what they're saying about them isn't necessarily true. Things really are a hell of a lot better. You know, maybe there is pockets where, of racism where people say this stuff. I have never seen it. I have honestly never seen it. And while this episode may have had some SJW stuff in mind, you know, telling us, see, America is still racist, I don't think it really was. It was talking about a time period where racism was quite rampant. It was the norm. <coughs> Good God, excuse me. <clears throat> I, uh, Attempted to breathe water, which is uh, never a good thing. Pardon me. Okay, that'll frack up my voice for just a moment. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, the cringe moment here is this character is from the Crac Crasco is from the 74th century. It's just hard for me to believe that by the 74th century you're going to have racism. I, I don't get that one. But there are great moments in this. There are a lot of great moments. As I say, this is one of those few times that it's so well made by the end, it actually brought something of a tear to me. I, and that is really difficult. The predestination paradox I find interesting, just because I'm also reviewing the film Predestination, which is all about a predestination paradox. But events wouldn't have occurred or played out the way they did if the doctor and her companions were not there. It seems that they were, in fact, part of a predestination paradox. They had to be there or things would not have worked out. 
I like that Crasco has a vortex manipulator. It is a nice callback to previous Doctor Who. I also like the Artron energy thing. You know, this is something they've used repeatedly in the 2005 series on. You know, the amusing thing about it is it was damn near a throwaway line by Peter Davison's Doctor in the episode 4 to Doomsday. So I find it interesting. It's one of those things where they glommed onto because it makes sense. It's a, it, it's a thing like dilithium crystals, right? We, we don't know what dilithium crystals really are. They don't actually exist. And Artron energy is the same. It doesn't actually exist, but it is something that the TARDIS uses. So that's kind of cool. The scene where Ryan meant, Ryan meant Martin Luther King that was really very cool. I did see it coming. Couldn't af avoid seeing it coming. You just sort of knew it was going to happen. But uh, Tosin Cole's performance really sells that. And I found that a really interesting and good moment. As I mentioned last week, the location shooting is always refreshing. And they did it again in South Africa here. I think they must have shot these episodes more or less back to back in South Africa. And as I said last week, I don't know that they'll do a South African shoot ever again because in terms of modern current affairs, they're quite likely to have a genocide of white people down there right now. It's not a precisely a great moment per se. I mentioned last week that one of the things I worry about whenever the uh, doctor goes to somewhere in the United States uh, that they'll screw up the accents. You know, you have British actors, or maybe in this case South African actors, with a totally different accent than Americans, but they did a very good version of it. They also did a very good version of a Southern accent, though I have no idea really whether they got it right for Alabama. See, there's regional variations. You know, the, the accent that's in Alabama, for example, is not the same accent that's over in Tennessee. And even American actors tend to get that wrong. And the fact that we had them here getting it right was very cool. I liked that very much. Um, they also got the cadence and idiomatic expressions right. British actors generally screw up the cadence of American uh, speech. Uh, it's hard to describe, but I notice when it's done very wrong. Similarly, the idiomatic expressions. For example, in Great Britain, they might use the term sorted out, where in the United States, we might say straightened out. They also, in the UK, you tend to use worked out, where in the United States, we might say fixed. So the fact that they got those idiomatic expressions right is uh, something for me. I, you know, they don't always do it in Doctor Who. I've seen them do it badly. But here, it's very good. For example, in... Um, uh, the first episode of Torchwood, Captain Jack pronounces the word, a word, estrogen. Well, that's a British pronunciation, but an American, American would say it, estrogen. Minor things. Stuff like that that tends to come up when the shooting episodes that occur outside, you know, in the United States or have people with a U.S. accent of some kind. Now, in terms of the writing on this, it's uh, attributed to Marjorie Blackman and Chris Chibnall. I don't know how much is of one thing or another, but I can tell you a bit about Marjorie Blackman. Ordinarily, when I do a mini review like this, I don't necessarily go through IMDb's or that sort of thing, but I looked up Marjorie Blackman and was rather impressed. <laughs> Her IMDb is 1966 to present, with a rather large gap between 2007 and 2018 with this episode. She has nine TV writing credits and one series in pre-production, and looks like largely she's on children's shows. However, she is one prolific author. She has written 67 books, including one called The Ripple Effect, which was a uh, Sylvester McCoy-era Doctor Who novel. Um, she's written five different book series, which is where a lot of those 64 novels come into. She's written four different TV series, including all the episodes of Pig Heart. And she's done two stage plays and one radio script. She has won the BAFTA Children's Award for Pig Heart Boy. Uh, clearly a very prolific and a talented author. And then Chris Chibnall is also uh, credited on this, and I really haven't the slightest idea uh, who did what. 
it was, in my opinion, really great writing. Just, just great. Um, again, I don't have any idea how much to attribute to one writer versus the other, but frankly, as a black woman, I would have to suspect that this was a labor of love for her, and I think it shows. And like I say, they, she got the idiomatic expressions and the cadence of the actors downright. So, part of the mini-review, the Doctor, again, played, as always this season, by Jodie Whittaker. Um, she is great, as she has been so far. She continues to basically be the Doctor. I have no problem at all, you know, believing her as the Doctor. Not a problem whatsoever at all. So uh, she did well here. There is, again, nothing that particularly stretches her as an actress, but still sort of this wisecracking, fast-moving doctor, which is so different from what we had for three years with Capaldi, I think is really good. And uh, if anything cements her for the eyes of the doctor, it cements her right here. Then there is... Graham, as always, played by Jeremy by uh, Bradley, Bradley Walsh. I s continue to still like him. Uh, he is, so far, my favorite character in this series uh, of episodes. I find it always amusing that when he wants to find out information, the first place he goes is to the bus drivers. <laughs> and the amazing thing is it works. It works every single time. When he goes to the bus drivers... He gets answers, uh, so I like that. I continue to like this character, probably because he's closer to my age. You know, it's somebody that I personally can identify with, and say, "Oh gosh, you know, I guess the doctor could get somebody who is my age running around with her." So I like that. There is Yasmin, played by Mendip Gill again, and she does a fine performance. She has marginally more to do here than previous two episodes. She still doesn't really have a character, per se. And I do continue to wonder, as I've mentioned before, that maybe this is, a, this is too many companions for character development. You know, previously, since the 2005 series started, previously... Doctor Who has been about the, the companions and not so much about the Doctor. It's character growth for the companions. And when you only have one companion, you can grow them over an entire series of 12 or 13 episodes. In this case, there's only 10, which makes it even more difficult. So with three of them, you have to do some type of character development all throughout. And that is really fracking hard to do. I, I think they may have shot themselves in the foot on this one by having too many companions. Let's just pare it all down. We'll leave everybody behind except Graham. I think that would be fine. Ryan is again played by uh, Tosin Cole, does a fine performance. He, uh, you know, when he's slapped, uh, looks like he's about to get into it. He's not at all happy with the amount of racism that's being shown to him here. And his uh, meeting with Dr. Martin Luther King was great. I just thought that was great. I mean, you kind of knew it was going to happen. You know, that time period, the fact that Rosa Parks knew him, you kind of figured that he must be going to do it at some time. But still, it was very well executed. His acting for it was really good. And he's good throughout. You know, when he's telling Rosa Parks it's going to get better. Yeah, he's right. It is going to get better. It has gotten a lot better. For those of you who believe that there is a resurgence of racism and, uh, you know, that sort of thing in the United States, I have to tell you, no, no. I'm living right now in the city that is the home of the American Nazi Party. Now, let me explain to you how that works. It's not like they have an office somewhere. There is a guy who has a broken down piece of crap house that's near where I went to high school. And when we went past, we used to point and laugh. It is a broken down ramshackle piece of crap because this SOB is a complete scumbag and no one will associate with him. He runs some kind of website out of there, I'm sure, and has newsletters and leaflets. 
But whenever you see Nazis together, I mean real ones, it's like 10 or 15 of them. That's what they can muster up for the most part. You know, Nazis and racists have my entire life, my whole life. I have observed this number of people getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, to the point where I just don't see it. Now, again, maybe it happens and I just don't know, but I don't see it. I have not actually associated with a real, honest-to-God, out-in-your-face racist in a long, long, long time. Decades. Absolutely decades. But again, Ryan's performance here, or, uh, to uh, Tosin Cole's performance is great. Just great. I, I love his performance here. Then there's Vinette Robinson as Rosa Parks. Again, another great performance. I really do buy her as Rosa Parks, a black woman living in, you know, Montgomery, Alabama, where there's so much racism that people get killed, you know, and uh, a white uh, husband, which she has, would be totally scandalous and probably give them, make them the target of some level of disdain or even violence. I really did believe her. You can see in her that there is an internal conflict starting in the beginning of that, you know, where they're in 1947 before they move forward to the doctor there. There is an internal conflict. She is asking herself, how far is she willing to go? And there is an enormous amount of tension at the end when she finally does not give up the seat. You are wondering as a viewer, I mean, you know what happens in history, but now you're dealing with the doctor and you know it has to work out. You know, you, the doctor, we're not gonna have this sudden change in history that would screw up everything for what we've got, but there is tension. You know, she is thinking to herself, what am I gonna do here? I, I'm, am I gonna do it or not? And then she chose, chooses to do it. Um, you know, I think for anybody in that situation, it would be something rolling around in your mind. This is wrong. Am I going to do it? You know, am I going to have the strength to sit here and then be arrested? Because back then, that was a big deal. That was really a big deal, especially with the cops there. I mean, the cops were as racist as anybody else. So there's this internal conflict going on, and I think it's very well executed such that as a viewer, we still went, okay, okay, uh, thank God she actually did it. You know, uh, very, very nice. Crasco is played by Josh Bowman, and again, another good performance. I certainly bought him as a racist. Even if it doesn't make sense that there would be racism in the 74th century, I still bought him as one. And I got a kick out of the fact that Ryan just zapped him into the distant past somewhere. Okay, I'd have done that. I'd have done it too. But it's damn, you know? Just like zap this guy into a place where maybe he's not even going to survive. To be honest, I get the feeling that we might see him again, although the how they'd explain him doing that without, you know, his vortex manipulator. I don't know. But I can imagine seeing him again before the series is of, season is over. Then there's Dr. Martin Luther King, played by Ray uh, Sesse. Uh, I'm not mentioning him much because he didn't have much to do. He just shook hands. But I want to mention him because they actually found someone who could pull him off. You know, not every actor can do that. There's lots and lots and lots of footage of Dr. Martin Luther King giving speeches, giving sermons. And, you know, he's a little more bombastic when he does that sort of thing. He's a little bit more bombastic about it. But here he's just a guy in a house, not in front of an audience. And, you know, it's great. It's very, very good. Now, as far as everybody else, <laughs> once again, they were getting the dialects and the cadence correct. And in terms of performance, I have no complaints. I mean, they're not, uh, you know, they're not anybody, you know, bus driver, you know, passengers, people they run into. They're all very, you know, small roles and small characters. And so you don't really see them very much. It's not worth talking about them very much. Although I do have to wonder, you know, they... I didn't look that hard to find out how many of these actors were actually South African. 
And South Africa has always been a hotbed for racism. You know, a fair percentage of my life, they had something they called apartheid, which basically made black people into complete second-class citizens. Well, that was done away with a number of years ago. I don't remember when, but it was done away with a number of years ago. And since then, black people have been essentially regaining you know, some level of being equal. However, they have recently said that black citizens in South Africa should, should go seizing white-owned farmed farms, just going in and kicking them out. And I have this sneaking suspicion, as I said, that we're about to see some type of, type of genocide down there. So I wonder if some of these are South African uh, actors, and in which case they have some personal experience to draw on, either from seeing what happened to black people under apartheid or looking at what's happening to white people now. And so that may have influenced uh, a lot of them to do pretty good performances as racist, you know. So I like that. In terms of the production, it was directed again by Mark Tondurai. Well directed, very well directed. He had a lot more to work with here um, by going on location and having certain things. He, it wasn't just a desert like they did the last episode. Here he had places to go, things to do. Very well directed. You know, you did a lot of crane shots. You did a lot of framing of characters. You know, there's a shot where the characters are walking, you know, past something. And, and he shot it by putting the camera down really low underneath something that's there. And then they're walking across. Uh, very creative camera work. Not everyone would have thought to do that. When they're at the motel that says whites only. He pull it's he pull, it's a it's a crane shot where he pulls up from the top of the sign and down to the characters to get their reactions to the whole thing. So uh, a lot of good creative camera work in here. Um, I, I, I am now impressed more uh, with Mike Mike uh, Tondrai. Uh, be very curious to see what happens going forward. I'm sure he's going to do more Doctor Who episodes. The cinematography was by Tico Pulakakis. Again, same guy as last episode, and I think the first one as well. Now, as I always say on these, I don't know how much of this is a collaboration between the cinematographer and the director. You know, usually the way it works is this, the director says what shots he wants to get, and it is the cinematographer's job to make sure that they get those shots. But sometimes you have people that are good and work together well, and you have a true collaboration. And when that happens, you tend to get some of the best work ever. When they're saying, hey, I think I'd like this shot, and the uh, cinematographer says, hmm, we can get that shot, but what if we did it just slightly differently, a little more dramatically or something, uh, for more emotional impact? And the director goes, oh, yeah, great idea. Let's do it that way. And then sometimes you have just directors who are absolute martinets who say, this is the way it's going to be, my way or the highway. I don't know what's going on here. Not a clue. All I know is they do operate under restrictions of a TV time and budget. As I often say very, very frequently, the <laughs> perennial enemies of any theatrical endeavor are talent, time, and money. I think they have lots of talent here, but time was in short supply, and they do have a pretty decent budget, but you still have to watch it. Your show still has to come in on time and under budget. Now, the visual effects are by Martin Western. Uh, there were not a ton of visual effects in this that I know about. God knows, they could have had green screens everywhere. I have no idea. I, I think you could probably say that the uh, shots when they're outside are probably less green screen, although, you know, in order to create Montgomery, Alabama out of South Africa, they may have done uh, a number of, you know, green screens and then adding in buildings and things like that that weren't present uh, on the set. Don't know. Don't know. Whatever happened, it was still excellent. It is what we've come to expect of Doctor Who. And it was seamless. So, hey, props for that. By the way, uh, on the cinematographer, I, I do mention, um, 
when you don't know what the hell's going on, you have to fall back on the two standbys, the two absolute requirements of a cinematographer. You could see what you were supposed to see, and you knew what you were supposed to look at. And that was definitely the case here. Production design, I got a bit to say about this, was by R. Will Jones. Ah. Oh. Location shooting. You have no idea how much I love location shooting. It is such a breath of fresh air to see these characters walking around in real environments rather than something that is half CGI or you can't even tell what CGI. Now, as I say, it may very well have been that in order to get everything that they needed to make this look like, uh, um, uh, you know, Alabama, they may have had to add some stuff in back in post. I, I don't know. This sort of thing is so common now, and it's impossible for me to tell which is which. But either way, location shooting, I loved. The locations were, in fact, in my opinion, just perfect. Um, in prior episodes, when they have not shot in the United States, it tends to feel wrong. It tends to feel like they have been uh, shooting somewhere in Britain trying to make it look like the U.S. So in this case, the South African setting allowed them to find locations that were close to the, South, uh, to the American South. Hey, Larry, Larry, thanks for coming in. Oh, you didn't see the email or the link? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, as I explained at the top of the show, YouTube has decided to frack me in the dren hole with precisely zero lubricant whatsoever. YouTube didn't show me uh, starting live. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have to work up to having subscribers who have hit the notification bell because otherwise I don't know if it's going to show anything for me. I had hit 200 subscribers. I was at 203 when YouTube decided to frack me. As it says in my lower third from time to time, YouTube sucks. Uh, anyway, getting back to the production design, uh, the fact that they were able to do it in South Africa, a place that is relatively warm, a place that is similar in some respects, that has the type of foliage that you would expect to see in a place like that, uh, really worked. It really did look and feel like uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. I have been to some places in that region of the South, never to Montgomery, but some places, and this looked it so um, I suspect the residents of Montgomery, Alabama would probably disagree. You know, they'll say, oh, that stuff couldn't come from Alabama to Montgomery. But hey, you know, to the untrained eye, somebody who's never been there, looked fine, looked good. Uh, Larry Larry says, you have all the notifications on. Well, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> YouTube is terrible. I uh, would, like, uh, would reiterate uh, for you or anybody else that pops in, I have decided that instead of doing these mini reviews at the beginning of the episode, Sunday nights at the same time period, 9, 8, 7, and 6, I will be doing mini reviews of Doctor Who that are going to run about a half an hour. So, um, you know, I'm going to do two shows now. And I may do that with the other ones. I don't want to interfere with these long reviews that I do for movies like Predestination. I'll just do the mini reviews, hopefully, the day that the episode comes out. Um, Doctor Who, I could do within an hour or two after the uh, show having aired. But I'm going to be nice, and I'll wait until it's aired on BBC America for some people. Uh, yes, Larry Larry says, some still think we are in the racist 1960s. I was talking about that earlier, too. Uh, real quick, just one last thing on the production design. I'll get back to that. The sets did capture, I think, perfectly the racism that you saw then. Black people living in utterly impoverished conditions, and the sets looked, period. You know, I didn't live in the 1950s. I, li I, I, I lived through some of the 1960s and 1970s, etc. But I do know, you know, how black people who were not affluent, and there were some, you know, there, there was a kid that I, I mentioned I was uh, friends with in uh, grade school. His father was an, uh, was a, uh, an attorney. Um, so they were living in pretty good conditions. But you know, I, I, I have seen some of the places that they used to live, and it was horrible. And to be honest, there are still some places like that. 
I used to, I, I once had to drive from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, up to Shreveport, Louisiana. And I drove past out and out tin shanties, stuff that I have not seen other than on the reservation at the, at the uh, Pine River, Ridge Reservation, in, Indian Reservation in South Dakota. There is still some of that poverty going on. But in general, as Larry Larry is intimating here, it has gotten much, much, much better. That kid that I mentioned earlier that I knew as, you know, he was a friend of mine. He was a friend, an out-and-out -out friend. And yet at the time, in the early 1970s, it was still socially acceptable to refer to him by the N-word. Even I, a friend of his, would occasionally do that. That was normal back then, just normal. And we got rid of that in the 1970s, and things got a lot better. At the time in the early 1970s, it was in fact true that people would be denied jobs based on either their gender or their uh, race. That really is no longer the case now. I know people want to think that, but it really is no longer the case if you're found out to doing that, you are subject to all manner of very expensive lawsuits that the complaint, the plaintiff will win if they can prove it. They're, you know, what we look for really is competency for a job. The problem is we have what amounts to ghettos in some of the larger cities and what amounts to a culture that does not want to do what white people have done. And consequently, they end up not being very educated sometimes. And if you're not educated, if you don't get educated, you will never go anywhere in this world. You will just be in poverty for the rest of your life. And you'll raise children who will probably be in poverty for the rest of their life. The best thing that anyone can do, black, white, Asian, anything, is get educated. Once you are educated, you can go anywhere, anywhere at all, but you have to be educated. Larry Larry says, believe it or not, not all of the South was racist, nor is it now. Yeah, I, uh, I mentioned that this, I think, is a really good episode. I think it's really well put together. At the end, and this is hard to do with me, believe me, as the fan die master, I have seen it all. It's very, very difficult to actually move me emotionally, but I was tearing up by the end. I think it's a really great episode from that. Now, some people probably think this could be some SJW thing where they're doing this because people think that there are more racists now in the United States than there have been. And no, 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 that's not true. That really is not true. I cannot remember the last time that I spoke to an actual out-and-out -out racist. I can't remember it. I, I just can't. It's been decades. Things have been getting much, much, much better better. Not to say that there aren't some racists out there, but I haven't seen one in decades. There is nobody I know that would refer to a black person or anyone else as inferior. They would never deny them a job based on their skin color. It just isn't nearly the kind of problem that it is was before. And as Larry Larry says, not all the South was racist. Yeah. Um, Montgomery, Alabama is a good example because they did, in fact, you know, Rosa Parks mentions it at one point, uh, a murder. Uh, they did do that sort of thing there, but not all the South was that racist. Uh, you people, Larry Larry says, UK people called people from India the N-word. Yeah, I'm sure that happened. I'm sure that happened. Uh, I don't know why. You know, as someone who hasn't seen a racist in so long, you know, to me, the whole concept of thinking of people as inferior is, it never enters my mind. You know, you see a black person, uh, a Muslim, and I don't think of them as inferior in any way. Uh, I just think that there is a subculture. Oh, I could get in trouble for this. From my observations after 53 years on the planet, 
I think there is a subculture in the United States as ghettos and very poor places that rejects anything that white men or white people have done, and that includes education. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. You have to get educated. If you don't, you will go nowhere. You will be doing a mick job for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter if it feels like, oh, I shouldn't be doing what white man is doing. Screw that. Do what the white man is doing. Get an education, and you will be able to succeed in life. Without it, you'll be doing a mick job for the rest of your life. So, back to the review. That little aside that I might get in trouble for somebody for. Please, YouTube, don't take that one down. Uh, we can look at other aspects of the production. The makeup was by Amy Riley. There's not much to say here. Uh, the makeup was mostly practical. You know, she's not doing, you know, lots of face makeup and everything. It's just makeup that's practical for what's on TV. Then It was fine. Great. Costume design. God, I'm going to get into this one for one reason. I thought the costumes were very, very good. They largely completely nailed the mid-1950s costumes. I loved them. I loved them. I have talked about <sighs> one of the videos that YouTube took down was the one where I was talking about 1950s fandom, and I could not re-upload it. When I tried uploading it to this channel, it was instantly rejected. Apparently, they have a database of stuff they've already rejected, and they kicked it off. I immediately deleted it so they didn't give me a damn strike on the new channel. It'll be up on BitChute. That's where I'm going to put it up is on BitChute. I think it's probably already there. I think most of my videos are going to go over to BitChute, my older ones. We'll just start from here. But they took that one down. And they, uh, I have yet to get the 1957 one up. Maybe I'll be able to get that one up here. But the costumes I thought were great. I thought they nailed them. I thought they nailed them. I, I, it was great. There is one thing that I have to mention. And it always bothers me when I mention this one. Because, you see, I've mentioned before in other reviews... A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was an actor. And I did some summer stock for several years. And it's, those are small theaters. Again, the, the enemies of any theatrical endeavor, talent, time, and money. Talent was usually pretty good, occasionally varied. Time and the money, however, in incredibly short supply. So what that meant was, if you're an actor and you're not doing something on the stage or rehearsing a scene you are farmed out to somebody on the backstage crew so that you would be doing work in between all of that. In fact, sometimes it would be a deal where uh, you would be uh, rehearsing a scene. It would be done. You'd go over and do whatever it is that you needed to do for the backstage part to get things running. And then somebody would come running and say, hey, you're, you got another scene you have to rehearse in about three minutes. And then you'd come back. <laughs> Happen all the time. Now, in my case... For reasons that were just pure happenstance, I got assigned to a customer. Now, what that meant was basically they would point me to what they wanted me to sew and tell me to sew it. I am no seamster. I never have been. Uh, the fact that I was uh, doing costuming for stage uh, where you don't have to have the same level of detail, uh, that's why they had me. And the second time it happened, second year that it happened, I had already had some experience with it. So they said, ah, good, you can go help the, the costumer. So that's how I ended up getting into costuming to some extent. I'm no costumer. What I did get was a real appreciation for when customers are doing it right. Two, uh, two summers, I was working with a customer who really was a stickler about it. And so here I go off again on the damn thing that I have brought up previously. Turned out to be a freaking absolute arc when I did all of the Star Trek Continues episodes. I don't want to sound like a creep, but they didn't get the bullet bras. I'm sorry, I, I, I used to do this costuming. 
And in one particular case, we did a 1960s period piece that required the use of period bras. And because the customer was absolutely a stickler for this kind of detail, we bought about two dozen Triumph Doreen bras because they made the shape of the breasts look correct for that era. And then we fitted the dresses and the blouses for them because they are fitted differently because of the shape of that bra. And so when I see it done wrong, which it was here, I can't get it out of my head. It's something that sticks out on me. I don't want to sound like somebody who's always watching women's breasts, but in period pieces, I notice it because of that summer when we bought all of these bras. As I say, purely happenstance that this even ever happened to me, but I cannot get it out of my mind when I find it. Larry, Larry says, You're, my mom tried to teach me to sew, at least to repair buttons, etc. Didn't stick, but thanks for trying, Mom. I can sew buttons. I can sew buttons. But if you want me to do any kind of costuming, I am screwed. You know, you're not going to find me doing any costumes for cosplay. I'll buy that stuff. I had very luckily, my chair's sunken down again, sorry. Very, very luckily, uh, my ex-mother-in-law, now deceased sadly, uh, was an excellent seamstress. She made me two Star Trek uniforms, one from the original series and one from Next Gen can't fit into them anymore <laughs> but uh, she was a great seamstress uh, me buttons buttons are about it yeah captain jesse uh hi thanks for finding me yeah well i wanted my you know my regulars to get here i i sent out emails where right. I, yeah excuse me i sent out emails where i could uh contacted you because i saw you were doing some uh, i went to your channel frankly um, I went to your channel and stalked you. I looked at uh, some of the videos you, you uh, had favorited and looked to see if you had any comments so I could find you. But I did want my, rel my regulars to find their way over here. Um, you know, I love you guys having here. And, it, you know, uh, if you can find your way here, that's great. And, of course, I'm starting out with very few um, subscribers anymore. So please tell your family, friends, neighbors, pets, and livestock to sub to my channel for my new channel. I want to get up to 100 if I get up to 100, that means I can have a custom URL on YouTube, which I'd really like. The URL that I've got now, I'm not even using. I tell people, go to tinyurl.com slash syl-ranch. It's the easiest way to get here. But thank you very much for being here, Jesse. And you too, Larry. Larry, I appreciate it very much. Anyway, aside from that little thing that I always want to throw out the caveat about why I notice it. It's not like I'm sitting there staring at women's breasts the entire time. It's just that my eye is trained for this because of one season where we had to buy two dozen Triumph Doreen bras so that the women looked more period because modern bras are not the same. Modern bras are designed to show cleavage. Literally, that's what they're for. 1960s, 1950s bras were not for that. That's not what they did at all. So I notice it because of that one season. Uh, Larry there he says, uh, Your mom made your original series uh, Star Trek blue science uh, uniform from plants from Major Barrett's Lincoln Enterprises. Yeah, mine did, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was Lincoln Enterprises, but we bought, you know, the... the, uh, the I, I don't call it plans. Um, but, uh, yeah, we bought those um, for both the uniforms that she did. it. We actually had, actually bought them for the movie era uniforms. She never got around to that, but those are fracking hard. You know, the jackets and stuff. And the plans, I mean, the instructions for those are kind of cryptic. Uh, it's why people pay a good, fair amount of money for those uh, uniform costumes because they're tough to make and easier to just buy than actually sew. Uh, again, just says, Brittany at uh, YouTube channel is a good sewing clothing maker. Okay, I'll take a look at that. I'll take a look at that. I know there are some real costumers out there. Uh, I know several, um, but uh, at this point, I don't have the money. And in any case, I, I don't want to be the guy at the con, you know, the kind of overweight one doesn't really fit the costume. 
uh, over on my uh, one of the things that's in my uh, uh, Amazon wish list is sort of a, my own version of a jacket costume that I've put together. Um, I'd like to be able to buy it someday, but ain't happening now, that's for sure. That would look okay on me. I, I've looked at it very carefully. That would look okay. It is not like any other costume you've seen in, the, in any series, but it would be an original series take on a jacket-type uniform. Uh, let's see. That is back to diapers. Maybe you can order uh, a special order for one or two piece. Uh, well, not something I need, fortunately, at least not yet. Give me some time. Larry, there it says the hidden zipper from neck down uh, to armpit was tough to do. Yes. Yes, that is a tough one. Uh, as I say, my ex-mother-in-law was a very good seamstress and uh, was very kind enough to do that uh, for me for Christmas gifts and stuff. But um, let's see. Kevin just says, yeah, you might look good in Scotty's engineering outfit uh, and next gen, uh, TMP to Star Trek V. Well, not the TMP ones, but uh, yeah, where he's like wearing that uh, white radiation suit or something yeah i probably wouldn't look bad in that uh unfortunately the jacket even the bomber jacket i'm just a bit too heavy for it i am lifting weights now i have my weight bench and i am lifting weights who knows i may get uh, you know slim enough so that it looks good uh but at the moment i wouldn't dare i would never dare to go to a con in one of those i just don't want to be that guy <laughs> Ah, uh, Larry Larry says, and uh, TMP uniforms were weird. Yeah, I don't like those uniforms at all. And I know I wouldn't look good in those. <laughs> uh, it's the same reason I don't look good in next-gen jumpsuit. Just don't look good. <laughs> anyway, back to this uh, mini review. Uh, let's see. Oh, you're referring to Scotty's white shirt and the black engineering vest. Yeah, that might work. Uh, the vest and shirt might work. That might work, um, you know, if it's fitted just right. Uh, but as I say, I'm kind of looking at something a little bit different. So maybe I'll put that out there sometimes so people can see it. I have had to pare down the descriptions on my uh, videos because I'm unclear if maybe that wasn't causing problems. I don't know. I don't know. They killed these videos, gave me strikes, and I have no idea why. I haven't the slightest clue why they've done it. And there's no way to find out. They kill you on it, and there is absolutely no way to discover why. And I'd like to know so that I can't do it again. So I have pared down my descriptions considerably. Uh, Larry, Larry says, Scotty's appearance in Next Gen was a nice, casual uniform. Yeah, and he kept it open, um, and it was fitted pretty well, so I like that. Back to our costumes, however. One thing that did strike me this episode because of my knowledge of the time period. You know, it's ordinarily something we overlook. The doctor and her companions show up someplace, you know, where their, where their clothes are totally anachronistic. Just totally anachronistic. And here it's anachronistic, but it's in such a way that people would stare. You know, the doctor's costume, for example totally anachronistic people would completely stare you were expected to have as a man suit and a tie and as a woman you know a dress or a blouse and a, and a skirt and not wearing them the way they were would have gotten them some weird looks at least and and maybe some ostracization i don't know again it's something we always just overlook you know the doctor always shows up in places where the clothing is totally anachronistic but it hit me this time, uh, and no, for no good reason, but it did. Captain Jess says, uh, of the election day for uh, towns and cities in Ontario, Canada, but still uh, not results for Smith Falls. I was unaware that you were having an election. Uh, I can barely keep uh, I can track of our own. <laughs> uh, I don't follow the Canadian ones so much. I have to worry about ours. So, uh, music here. Music here, again, by Sagun Akinola. Well, I continue to like this music. He did some great use of period music in places, and particularly the end titles. Letting a period piece play through the end titles I thought was really good. 
Um, there were a couple of bombastic moments here, not as bombastic as uh, Murray Gold had been, but, uh, you know, who would be? Nobody was going to be Murray Gold again. You have to put your own stamp on it, and I think the stamp that they're putting on it is very, very good in a very good way. Captain Justice, who was the music classic, or um, who was the music classic, or modern Doctor Who? Um, I think uh, uh, Sagun uh, Akinola, I have to keep looking at the name, does a good job of somewhere being in the middle. You know, the opening titles, right? Uh, that theme harkens back to classic Who. The music here, I would say, is more modern, but it's not the music that we're used to with Murray Gold, who had done the series all the way up until this season. Um, Murray Gold's music is very bombastic, you know, lots of big themes that typically fit the action, but sometimes were a little much. Um, what Sagun Akinola is doing here is, uh, Akinola, sorry, is doing here is different music, but it fits, it works, everything's fine. And again, the use of classic, not classic, but period pieces from, you know, the 1950s in order to underscore some things I thought was really, really good. I'm continuing to like his music. Uh, Captain Jesse, Larry Larry says, Tom Baker's outfits didn't seem to look weird wherever he went other than that huge scarf. Yeah, that's the thing, too, about male doctors. You know, you can put a coat, a bow tie, you know, on somebody, an overcoat, and it'll fit in in a lot of time periods. It's going to look pretty out of place when you go to, like, you know, ancient Rome. But it's something we always overlook. I don't know why it struck me here. I really don't. It's something we always overlook, but I don't know why. Uh, Cam just says, Bill, do you look a bit like Tom Baker, Doctor Who? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I consider that a compliment. Tom Baker is my doctor. Uh, we did, however, when, I was, uh, when he was first showing. We used to do a joke. Friends of mine and I who were science fiction fans are Whovians. We did a joke. Because we didn't really get some of the subtleties of Tom Baker's performance, we'd say, here is Tom Baker happy. Here's Tom Baker sad. Here's Tom Baker excited. Here's Tom Baker when he's really ticked off. Because you know, that's kind of his performance. But despite that, he is my doctor, and thank you for saying that I look like him. So, at the end of a mini-review that's already taken an hour four, which may be a good thing considering what's going to happen with the uh, predestination review, we have to ask ourselves, is it any good? I would say, oh, hell yes. It is the best for season 11 so far. Now, it's not Day of the Doctor best, but no one is ever going to top that. You know, you have to put that back in your mind as this was the pinnacle, but it is still the best episode so far of this season. It is, I think, a really fine episode, if it can bring a tear to this old Fandai master's eye, then it is doing the job right. And as I've continued to say, this all adds up. Everything, the production design, the lighting, everything, 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 is a complete departure from the very dark, washed-out, death, destruction type of Capaldi-era uh, episodes. It is a very, very good thing that they're doing this. And I would definitely recommend this episode. Uh, Captain Jess says maybe the electronic polls are breaking the vote count. Uh, was Pembroke uh, have to re-vote tomorrow on paper votes? Uh, no idea. No idea. I, I, I don't follow Canadian politics much, just enough to know generally who the prime minister is. You know, when you get into more local politics, not a clue. Not even sure how that works from your perspective. So sorry about that. I am a typical American. I know very little about other countries' politics. Uh, you like good old-fashioned paper voting. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think it's much easier to do voter fraud. I have, I have a copy of one of the programs that they use for electronic voting. God is that vulnerable. Just from a technical perspective, it's very vulnerable. I think paper voting is a better way to go, honestly. I, it's weird to say that in modern times when I've got, uh, you know, so much experience in IT, but I'm saying, I'm saying, man, paper review, paper, paper voters, that's a good thing. 
Uh, Larry Larry says, I haven't seen any new episodes, so I'll try to find them online. Don't have cable or satellite. Um, I believe, hang on a second. I can't put it in my descriptions anymore. That may have been part of what got my last channel killed. Uh, but I can tell you where I've been getting them. Put Locker, P U T L O C K E R T V dot T O. Put Locker TV dot T O. Now, as always, as someone who was in uh, you know the field for forty years, always, always, always have really good ad blockers. <laughs> always have really good ad blockers. Um, if you're doing it inside of a normal web browser, if you've got any of the good ad blockers out there, I use uBlock Origin. If you go to that site, it'll pretty much kill everything. If you're using a handheld device, um, that's harder to get the ad bloggers to work right. Be prepared for the pop-ups that you have to shut down before they start whining at you about, we have scanned your Android device. And, and they'll even get the, uh, the type right. You know, they'll say, your Kiro, Sarah, whatever, has 59 viruses that are going to destroy everything, including your SIM card. Well, that's, that's all nonsense. But if, you, if you're ready... If you're sitting there with that thing in your hand and you've gone to that site and you got the tap, oh, second open, seven window opened up, close it, second window opened up, close it instantly if you're waiting to do that. In a web browser using uBlock Origin, no problem that I've ever found. Uh, no Netflix. Yeah, I won't pay for Netflix. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when you're doing broadcast, right, and they're relying solely on advertising revenue, I don't have to watch what I don't want to watch. When you're doing Netflix, you're signing up and you get four million things. But I'm the kind of guy that maybe only wants to watch one or two of them. Um, let me put it into the chat. Hang on a second. That's where I go. Put Locker TV. Put Locker TV .to. Again, be prepared for pop ups. Make sure you have ad blockers. And don't tell anybody that I told you that. <laughs> yeah, put. So, that concludes that uh, review. I think it is a great episode. It had me tearing up by the end. And that happened three times because I watched that episode three times. If you can do that to me, that's a good episode because I am old. I am the Fandai master. I have seen it all. And it's usually very, very hard to move me emotionally. So I liked it. It was a very well put together episode. 